Good day to all of you. So today we are going to start a new lesson and uh, the lesson is going to be about understanding the basics of research. My name is Narayan Selvaratnam and I will be helping you to understand the purpose of us doing research and at the same time I will be helping you to figure out more about the kind of thinking that is required for research and in what kind of circumstances we would go for research. And also I will help you uh, know more about uh, different types of research. For example, what is qualitative research, what is quantitative research and so on. So without further ado, let me share my screen here and let's uh, go through today's lesson. Okay, now here's what we are going to do. Give me a second. Okay, so this is our presentation. Now today we are going to have a discussion about, like I said, uh, qualitative research, quantitative research, and then inductive and deductive thinking. Now, uh, we'll be discussing a few concepts, but before we uh, go through all of this, I will introduce you to some of the basics and what kind of readings you need to consider. So my assumption is that you are totally new to psychological research, brand new, which means you have never studied. So this would be ideal for individuals like that. So let me first take you through some of the recommended reading you should have. I have included here a book by Graveter and Fosano. I have done the same book during my undergraduate studies as well. Uh, this one is Research Methods of Behavioral Sciences. So this book has to be purchased. So I'm not asking anyone to purchase it. But then again, if you want to have a solid understanding about research methods and how the method has to be utilized for different uh, types of research, and if you need to have an A to Z kind of an understanding about research, quantitative research specifically, this is one of the go-to books. And then for you to understand statistics, I have included Gravita and Wall, you know, Statistics for Behavioral Sciences, 8th edition. Now, this is, of course, not the most updated edition, but this edition would do. And the good thing is I actually found a free version here. So please click on this hyperlink and it will directly take you to the book. See, one could always ask why exactly we need to learn statistics. Well, for quantitative research, you need to know a little bit of statistics, not a little bit. If you know more, of course, it would benefit. But for a first year student or for a diploma student, knowing a little bit of statistics will help me uh, tell you more about the entire research cycle. Because we have to know how to find a problem, how to develop methods, how to collect data and how to analyze. Then only we know that we have completed the research cycle. Because if we don't know that, that's going to be a bit of an issue. So I am going to help you understand a little bit of statistics, not too much. This, uh, these lessons are not uh, to help students understand in depth about statistics. But then I still hope for a starter, this kind of you know books would be very beneficial. So if you have free time, download the book. You know, go through each lesson, maybe a lesson for every week. That's what I did when I uh, learned statistics and research methods uh, for statistics specifically. Every week I did one lesson. So that is something that you should be doing as well. And there are good practice questions and you can work on all the practice questions. And then practice questions will further prepare you to understand more about all of this. And then there's a good book written by a Sri Lankan professor as well, Samaja Gaveshakeya the researcher of the real world. And this is available to be purchased in uh, stores outside. It cost about uh, 9,000 rupees. The good thing is one of the problems always some of my students say is that uh, subject is interesting, but some of the words are too difficult because if you have learned everything in Sinhala, suddenly trying to convert everything to English could be a little bit difficult. So Samaja Gaveshakaya, this book is a research methods book written in Sinhala. Uh, so very effective if you really need to understand the, the original concepts that we will be discussing. Okay, now that is for quantitative research and uh, Professor Salius one actually has information about both qualitative and quantitative and for qualitative method, uh, a book I would suggest you is Cresswell's research design book. Uh, qualitative, quantitative, and mixed method approaches. So it addresses all the uh, approaches. But for qualitative researchers, that is one of the go-to books. 
And then here's another one, uh, Smith, Flowers, and Larkin, Interpretative Phenomenological Analysis, Theory, Method, and Research. This is another great book. Uh, I actually have the book uh, with me, not right now. It's in my other house in Colombo. But uh, it's an excellent book. It will help you understand more about how qualitative research works. And at the same time, it will give you an A to Z kind of an idea about how it has to be applied. And they have given some sample studies as well. So uh, an excellent read if you really uh, want to understand about qualitative research. Now, uh, when we write research papers, we need to format them. There are multiple types of formatting, but I'll be focusing on APA styling and referencing. So for that, I have given a small link here. If you take this, it will give you more information about how referencing works. But that's a lesson for another day. I'm not going to go into that today right now. For the time being, let's just focus on uh, research. Now, I already told uh, about uh, quantitative research and qualitative research, and I still didn't tell anyone of you what exactly is meant by qualitative and quantitative research, but we'll get there. Until we get there, we are going to focus a little bit more on other supplementary material. Now, I have included two of my sample research papers as well. So um, the first one is about understanding South Asian collegiate experiences. This is once again a qualitative paper. And then next one, the challenges of Sri Lankan minority leadership in state universities. This is also once again a qualitative paper. Okay, so if you are interested in understanding about uh, more qualitative research. I have more qualitative research published on my ResearchGate account as well. You can go to my ResearchGate account and I would encourage you to create a ResearchGate account as well to access more papers. And then you can, of course, go to my profile and read some of my research work as well. And not just mine, you can, of course, read other people's work as well, other good researchers' work. So it's, that's very important. So uh, some of the basic expectations in the class, I expect everyone to uh, read, but you don't uh, need to memorize any of the things. Uh, but it's important that you comprehend the basic theory that is required to have a better understanding about research methods. So if you have questions, the first thing as a researcher, what you should do is you need to research an answer. But when you think that you have encountered or you have met up with a bottleneck or you can't go ahead because you are stuck, then you can actually talk to me and then I should be able to help you to understand the concepts better. So this class requires critical thinking. I want all of you to think critically about extracting information, uh, doing a systematic inquiry. What is right? What is wrong? Is my thinking right? Am I being biased? These are the kind of questions I want you to ask from yourself. So that's a very important aspect of this class. And I also expect students to go through assigned learnings. It's very important that you spend some amount of time every week to uh, know more about these concepts. Now, software needed, we would be needing uh, SPSS, but uh, if you are a first year student, not very necessary. We can do these things with uh, Microsoft Excel as well. Uh, if you have SPSS, then yes, that is very good. If you don't have it, then we should be able to download it. And then, but if SPSS is uh, expensive or you don't need to pay for it, there's another uh, version, an alternative version that you can use that is called Jamovi. It is available free of charge online. You can access it online as well. It's there, there's a cloud version. So that's a pretty good one as well because I use a Mac and as a result, uh, some of the SPSS functionality doesn't really work. So SPSS is a software called Statistical Package for Social Sciences one of the go-to statistical softwares we use in psychology, okay? So uh, I, also have a, I also have written a book on R, uh, R package, uh, specifically, go, uh, specifically for first-year students. Now, in this class, we'll be discussing a little bit of statistics, like I told. So if you don't have any of the softwares that I just told, you can download R and then in R I have written a very simple book about 40 pages with the necessary, you know, quotes and all of that so that you can uh, work on R as uh, and learn statistics through that. R is a fascinating software, but the only issue is you need to know programming. So if you are a computer science student studying psychology uh, on a part-time basis, you already know programming. I would encourage you to, you know, go through my book and learn a little bit of coding 
probably you know coding already so you just need to know how to do r you know commands and then you can go ahead and do the rest very easily you can figure it out and i am i can help you with that as well so think of any software that you would like so there is no hard and fast rule saying you had to go with this software you don't need to even in, uh, install spss if you think uh, that jamo is going to be uh, your software and you can of course use excel as well i think excel is available free of charge in all our uh laptops or maybe right now i don't know sometimes uh, some individuals had to pay and get excel but if you have anyways excel in your laptop then problem sorted okay more supplementary material so free resources to learn spss and research now one of the go-to channels that i go to is how to stats.com there are quite a lot of videos on how to perform statistical analysis as a student i have used this channel as well excellent and then uh, our journal has a channel as well, Legal Journal of Contemporary Research. This has information about how to do academic writing, how to do, you know, referencing and stuff like that. Uh, Nurse Killam, it's a very good channel. Uh, Dr. Amgad Badevi, that's an excellent channel, explains quite a lot about how to do research, what research is and all of that. Uh, Dr. Kriko, excellent channel. Once again, it has quite a lot of information about qualitative research methods and all these kind of things and I also have my own research playlist and I have pretty much put almost all the videos that are necessary uh, for a first year first semester student to understand what research is and I have included a little bit of a second semester material also in my playlist and then the plan is to you know have a in and out you know like a fully covered uh, set of videos so that any student who wishes to learn more about research can actually come to this uh, channel and get all the required information for them which is exactly why I decided to write a book on R as well so that it will all work uh, uh, accordingly okay now with that now we are going to start our lesson now one of the first things I need to tell you is before we go through and try to understand what research is, it would be great if we can understand what the research database is. Now, one of the first questions we need to ask from ourselves is, if we need to find information, from where are we going to find this research information? If you listen to news, if you watch certain uh, programs in television, they say uh, research indicates this and this. In Facebook, in other social media, we always see psychologists have said something like this. So the question you should be asking is, don't believe anything just because you see it on social media. The question you should be asking from yourself is, is this accurate? Is this right information? So then I should be able to locate this piece of research for me to know whether this is right or wrong. So here I have listed some research databases. Now, there are quite a lot of databases. Uh, one of the common ones we use is called PsycInfo, and there's another one called EBSCOhost. Now, the issue is those are available. If you have some university access, then you can go through that and access these databases. But now, I don't have access to those databases. So instead, I'm trying to focus more on uh, places that I actually have some access. So Google Scholar is another one. You can find papers and research through Google Scholar. But today for this uh, lecture, I'm going to introduce you to three. One is a directory of open access journals. It's uh, It has information about all the open access journals. So through this, you can go and find articles as well. Open access means anyone can come and read. Usually, some of the journals are not open access. You have to either pay them to see their papers if there needs to be some subscription. And then we have another one called Frontiers. Once again, you can access quite a lot of papers that are published by Frontiers here. And then there's we have uh, National Library of Medicine, NCBI. Uh, from this also, you can access quite a lot of papers. So there's a few others like this as well. But now what I'm going to show you first is how to find some information. Before we even discuss about research, I just want to show how exactly we are going to find some information. So let's open these websites. 
and once we are in let's type something related to psycho let's say depression medication psychiatric medication motivation so anything that we want to find okay and let's see whether we can find papers now i am going to go to my internet explorer so google chrome i don't have internet explorer okay give me a second Okay, I'm going to share now. Right. Now, this is uh, the directory of open access journals, Doge. Now, here, this is the basic interface. It has research papers in 80 languages, 136 countries, 13,574 journals without fees, and 20,202 journals and altogether 9 million or so uh, article records. So now I'm going to search some articles in all fields. You can even filter from here, but I'm going to just write, so it gives it give some information, self-efficacy, depression, motivation. So I'm just going to find some information about self-efficacy. That's a concept that I'm interested in. Uh, it's about the degree to which you believe in yourself. So I'm going to just give a little bit of a search here. So I get 25,552 index articles that has something to do with self-efficacy. This is the first one. Psychological factors associated with fibromyalgia and the areas of psychological intervention. Now, this, of course, is not 100% related to what I want to find. So I'm going to just uh, make a few other, you know, uh, additional uh, words or uh, so that I can uh, make this a uh, bit more you know focused so let's say self-efficacy and let's say depression something like this let's search this whether we can find it here see now i have 2033 articles so now it is a little bit more focused so whatever the thing that you need to find you have to have a strategy like this to find the right you know set of papers let's see a brief intervention to increase up, uh, uptake and adherence to an internet-based program for depression and anxiety so it doesn't necessarily have anything 100% on self-efficacy, but it has something on depression. Oh, relationship between self-efficacy and depression among family caregivers and chemical warfare elderly veterans. Now, this is this sounds okay. It has information about efficacy and depression. So I'm going to just click on this. Read online. Let's see whether we can access this paper. Yes, we can actually access this paper. It's available in Afferent Scholarly Publishing Institute, Iranian Journal of War and Public Health. And it has information here. This is the title of the research paper. Uh, we have a small abstract here as well. And then you can click on this to download the PDF. Let's see whether we can actually download the PDF. Yes, I downloaded the PDF. So let's click on this and then open it up. Hmm. Here we have the full research paper. So if you want to read a research paper like this, but unfortunately this is in Arabic. So because of that, I can't read it. So which means I have to find another paper. That happens sometimes because we don't know what kind of uh, language sometimes we are going to. So that's okay. Now here's another one, uh, but I don't think this is directly related to what I want to find. So when you want to find research papers through databases like this, the thing is you have to filter as much as possible. Okay. Mm, so here's some more. Oh, here's another one. A guided imagery improves mood, fatigue, and quality of life in individuals. This is not exactly the paper that I want to, you know, have for my uh, two words that I have included, but just to show you, I'm going to just click on this. Let's see. Okay, now it is available in Sage. So you have the entire paper here. And you should be able to access the PDF for the most part. Yes. Okay, so here we have the PDF. So you click on this. and then it will take you to a reader. So here you can actually read the paper. 
and if you want to download you can download the paper as well so this is a research paper we'll discuss more about research papers the nature of a research paper anatomy of a research paper and all of that but i just wanted to show you how to find credible information you might ask how exactly you know these are credible usually directory of open access journals these are databases where they actually see whether journals are good or bad there's a bit of quality assurance process in these ones so whatever the results they give generally are credible you know research results so that is the first one and if you go to frontiers once again it is very similar you click on all articles And then you can go ahead and you know find research papers. For example, let's say depression and efficacy. Uh, let's say depression and uh, motivation, something like that. I just wanted papers on that. Then you would actually find uh, papers on these. So fifteen thousand nine hundred ninety-three articles. Now you have to be very specific because if you see, there are different types of depression and uh, related to different fields. Now here, depression and PTSD in high school students affected by Great East Japan earthquake related to that. Here, this would be victims of bullying. So whatever the thing that you need to find, you have to put very specific terms and words and based on that, you will get the search results. So you get my idea here also. And the last one I need to show you is uh, National Library of uh, Medicine. Now here also you would find uh, this a database. I can do the same thing here again, depression and let's say motivation. Let's type like this and then hit search. So now it is searching. So results found in 13 databases. So, uh, Let's click on one of these literature. I can, I'll go to PubMed. Just see what exactly I can find here. See patient motivation and adherence to metacognitive therapy for depressive disorder. So these are all papers that you can actually access and read. Okay, let's click on this one. Let's see whether this one is accessible or not. Yeah, this one is not accessible. This is just uh, the abstract. So that is not useful for us. But it says here it's a free PMC article. So let's just click on this one. Yeah, so here you can read the entire paper. Not the entire paper. Just the abstract. Oh, yeah, it's a free full text. Hmm. Now here you have the full text. So you can check whether it is freely available or not, and you can pretty much go for uh, articles that are freely available and read. Now that's a little bit about how to find research information, research papers. So I just wanted to make sure that you have some understanding about what a research database is before we begin everything. Now with this information, I want to tell you one of the good things about learning research is learning how to read research papers. So when you learn how to read research papers, you can actually make it a fun activity by trying to find research papers whenever you come across a specific problem so that you can make a very informed decision. Now, with that information, let's try to understand what exactly research is. So research, generally speaking, is a systematic inquiry. You are inquiring or you are diving into a problem to come up with a possible solution. And sometimes the entire research could be about finding the problem. And sometimes it's about finding the problem and coming up with the possible solution. So this has to be done in a very systematic way, which means there is a specific method to it. This is exactly why we call it a systematic inquiry. So I have given some basic research questions. So basic research titles here. So let's go through the three titles I have. And the first one is effects of socioeconomic status on individual happiness. Well, I possibly could do a research about that as well to see whether socioeconomic status has something to do with individual happiness. 
and exploring the benefits of flexi hours on employee productivity. I could see that as well. If I am working in an organization, if I am to introduce flexi hours to my employees, maybe I'm interested in identifying whether those kind of flexi hours is going to have any impact on their productivity. That's a good research. And then see, exploring the importance of worker autonomy in higher education. That's a possible research as well. If my, uh, let's say, if my colleagues are given 100% of the freedom to decide what they want to teach and what they want to do, will that improve higher education, you know, uh, the outcomes of higher education? If you notice here, I have colored the words effects exploring. Now, words like exploring are mostly to understand something, you know, the phenomena that you are interested in, maybe to explore it more and more, to understand the depth of a problem and things like that. But effects, we are going to see whether two things actually relate with each other or not. So these words are important to notice. I'm not going to tell why exactly it's important right now. But it is important because the kind of research approach that you take will determine the kind of words that you are going to put to your title. Now, at this stage, we haven't discussed about what is qualitative research and what is quantitative research. But for the time being, let's just keep in our minds, depending on whether you are going for qualitative or quantitative, your word choice changes. The words like effects are usually quantitative, like math-driven kind of research, stat-driven kind of research. Exploring is usually associated with qualitative research. Now, if you notice, each of these titles and statements, they try to identify or come up with the solution. But you can come up with the solution only if you have a problem. So in research, the starting point of a research is finding a problem. One of the most common mistakes I notice a lot of students do in their undergraduate degrees, in their final dissertations is their dissertations are limited to a set of variables, which is all right. But the thing is, they focus only about finding the relationship between variables and they don't give any reason to consider why exactly this research is important. A research is important if it addresses a specific problem. If I want to study benefits of flexi hours on employee productivity, one could ask, why do you want to study that? Then I could say, well, look, there's a problem in Sri Lanka where a lot of people find it very difficult to come to work on time at eight because there's so much of traffic and people are stressed. Some people got into accidents and so on and so on. So when people are stressed, they don't work very well. So as a result, I think if we can give flexi hours where some people can at least come at 10 and stay until, you know, without uh, leaving at four, they can stay until six and then leave. If we can have flexi hours like that, that stress will go away. As a result, I am interested in finding whether flexi hours could have an impact on employee productivity. You see, now I have two variables, but I just connected it with the problem. Now, because of the problem, it makes sense for me to go to and do this research. So therefore, problem is extremely important. Without a problem, you can't proceed with the research. So simple as that. Now, the way of finding this is what we'll be discussing throughout this entire you know, set of weeks. We have all the upcoming weeks discussed about how exactly we are going to develop our method. So you find a problem. And the next big question is, how are you going to solve this? How are you going to uh, find a solution for this? So for that, you need to develop a methodology so research methodology is all about that okay now learning outcomes of the present lecture we are going to understand the importance of research and then we are going to understand the differences between qualitative and quantitative research and we are going to focus on inductive thinking and deductive thinking this is exactly what we are going to do but before we go forward i'm going to take you through another paper uh, Naib D.W. Metcalf C. Ganel D. WHO Suicide Statistics, a cautionary tale. This is available in Ceylon Medical Journal, 60th volume, first issue, pages one to three, available online. I have given the hyperlink as well. And what you guys see here, this is what we call a reference. Okay. Now, in-text citations and references, we haven't talked about yet. 
probably in other modules you may have learned but i will later you know upload a lecture on that as well but for the time being this is what we call a reference a reference helps readers locate a specific paper that you have extracted information to write your paper now let's take this reference for a second Get yourself into small groups. If you are listening to this or watching this online by yourself, then you can do this by yourself. Take 15 to 20 minutes to read this paper and explain what you were able to learn from this paper. Then answer the questions below. Now, before we go through the questions, let's actually go through this paper. Now, this is the paper. WHO Suicide Statistics, A Cautionary Tale. Here you will see the authors who have written this and with these numbers you can see which person is attached to which university. Usually to find the credibility of a research paper it's important that you look for the information of authors as well and who has published this, what is the journal. So the journal is Ceylon Medical Journal, it's a credible journal. And then here we have the DOI number, this is Digital Object Identifier helps us to uh, find papers. Uh, you can find papers through this as well. So it's like a unique digital code, okay? So this will help us identify the papers from one uh, another. And then uh, the first author is attached to School of Social and Community Medicine, University of Bristol. And uh, the others are attached to South Asian Clinical Toxicology. Faculty of Medicine, University of Theradini and Sri, uh, in Sri Lanka. Okay, so uh, these are the two institutes, so pretty credible institutes. So let's go through this. So it's a very small paper, so it won't take too much of time. So on the 4th of September 2014, WHO released their first global report on suicide prevention. The main objective of the report was to raise awareness of suicide as a public health issue and prioritize suicide prevention around the world. Okay, the report uh cautions readers that the quality of the mortality data for 112 of its 172 member states is poor that's a public health concern and needs to be interpreted with caution especially for low and middle income countries so sri lanka was one of the 112 member states for who recommends caution following the publication of this report media groups in sri lanka reported with some concern that Sri Lanka had the fourth highest suicide rate in the world at 28.8 per 100,000 males. So now uh, male rate is 46.4 per 100,000, female is 12.8 per 100,000. So yeah, we have a pretty high suicide rate. And the rate was modeled using the latest mortality rate, uh, mortality data uh, submitted to WHO. So this case study highlights the importance of users of the WHO suicide data to do so with caution and if used, ensure that readers are aware of the limitations of this data source. Now, this is some data. Now we just went through this paper very quickly. It's a small paper. Now let's get back to our presentation. Now, is this a research paper? And if your answer is yes, you should be able to justify it. Yes, it tries to address a problem, but it, they haven't done a full-blown research, but they have provided some information and requested uh, readers to have some uh, concern when they interpret or be mindful when they interpret the mortality rate or like the suicide rates in Sri Lanka because the data is not 100% uh, you know, thorough. And so is this a research paper? Well, you can't consider it as a research paper, but it has some research information. Now, how many researchers are involved in this paper? If you notice, we have three researchers, three authors. Is this a quantitative or qualitative research? Well, it's not a research per se, but it has quantitative information. Quantitative means, you know, statistical information is there. So I would say it is... Uh, short report which has quantitative information but not necessarily a quantitative research if you are a research officer at the ministry of health how would you convince your seniors about the seriousness of these findings now research is conducted to solve problems like i mentioned but after solving the problem what are we going to do about it are we going to you know uh, 
change some policies at national level, what are you going to do about it? Now, if you know the mortality rate is high, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to do more research to get a better answer for this? Now, that is something you should be doing. See, we want to find a problem to do a research. Now, if the data is not thorough, if the data is not 100% clear, I think one of the first things you could do is show that as a problem and then go ahead and do a proper research to identify the rates because anyways the suicide rate for males is significantly higher compared to female and the overall rate is also high in that case considering that sri lanka is going through economic issue right now a better thing would be to actually go ahead and do a, another research to make sure that these statistics are right or wrong probably it is more pronounced i think compared to you know what they have given here so something like that so this is exactly how we use information of one research to go ahead and do a better research okay now uh, selection of a research approach so how do we select an approach for our research for example research approach now this is the definition of Cresswell in his book in 2014 research approaches are plans and procedures for research that spans the steps from broad assumptions to detailed methods of data collection, analysis, and interpretation. When you have a research problem, you need to figure out an approach. Am I going to use statistical information to do this research? Or am I going to go ahead and talk to people and get their interview reports and I'm going to find credible information through that? If you go with the statistical side, you are going with quantitative research. If you are going with the uh, interview side, then you are going ahead with qualitative research. So this one has statistics. This one has no statistics. Okay. Based on that, of course, when you take these approaches, there are different assumptions and things like that that you need to follow. Right now, I'm not going to get into that. Let's just think. Depending on the approach that you select, the kind of people that you are going to meet to collect your data, the kind of analysis that you are going to do with the data that you have collected, and how you are going to interpret all of this greatly changes. I'm going to show you a sample paper. This is a very simple quantitative research so that you would get some understanding. Okay, now here's the paper. This is actually published in our journal. A retrospective study on patients with ENT, ear, nose, throat injuries following road traffic accidents at a tertiary care medical institution in Sri Lanka. So here we have the names of authors. And here we have a very small abstract as well. And now here we have a little bit of an introduction, a methodology, results, now, if you just look at this, it is very clear that this is a quantitative research. Why? Because it has quite a lot of statistical information. Age distribution of patients managed with ENT injuries due to road traffic accidents. So here they have given based on age how many people have come up with these kind of accidents. And it's very clear 21 to 40 bracket is uh, the most common one. Likewise, it has given some information. See, percentage of patients managed based on the site of injury. Nose injuries were more common compared to ear and other injuries in the ENT ward. Even uh, percentage managed based on time of admission. Admission times tend to be uh, more frequent for ENT accidents between 6 and uh, 12 in the evening to midnight. So likewise, so these are some quantitative findings and one could ask how is this relevant. So you can actually use these kind of findings to refine uh, policies related to uh, the flow of traffic and making changes to, you know, traffic designs and stuff like that as well. So I'm not going to get into that information here, but rather what I would do is I would encourage you to go through this paper to understand how this paper is different from the previous paper that we have discussed. So this is, as I said, quantitative paper because it has statistical information. And if you notice, it has a specific section called methods. In this methods section, they describe how they collected data, what are the methods they use to analyze the data, and all these kind of information. And if you notice, 
This actually has the format of a normal research paper, which means it has a title, it has an abstract, and it has an introduction section, methodology, results, and a discussion. Okay, so the purpose of an abstract is to give a summary to the entire research report. And then introduction introduces the reader to the problem. And the methodology says to address this problem, how are we going to collect data and analyze our data? And then the result says, okay, look, here's what we have found. And then the discussion says how uh, similarly or how similar or different the data that I have found uh, uh, compared to, you know, the existing data that we have. And what do you think this newfound data says? So this kind of information is given in the discussion section. Now we'll discuss later in depth about uh, the overall, what do you call qualitative and quantitative research and also the anatomy of a research report. We'll discuss the anatomy of a research report in depth, but for the time being, just you know, go through this so that you would have some understanding. Now, let's discuss about uh, qualitative research. Qualitative research. Now, uh, qualitative research will be focusing a little bit, but mostly will be focusing on quantitative research. So, like I told earlier, this is text-based research. We don't use any statistical procedures. Here we use an inductive uh, process, inductive thinking process. And uh, usually we find all our uh, data through interviews. So by interviewing a person at a time, if you interview a group of people at any given time, we call them focus groups. And then sometimes we review documents as well. We can consider already published documents like newspapers, uh, other kinds of you know blog posts and these kind of things as well. Policy papers, we analyze them to understand more about this. And in qualitative research, you can even analyze artifacts, diaries, letters, almost anything that you can think of. But uh, using multiple sources is very important for qualitative research because you can't rely upon interviews of a limited number of individuals. Because when you want to interview, you can't interview hundreds of people. That is technically impossible to analyze all that data. Because when you interview someone, you have to transcribe it word to word. Transcription means you write word to word what the person has said in Microsoft Word or something. And then you have to analyze all of that. Usually a 30 to 45 minute interview contains roughly about 5,000 words. So if you interview 100 people, that is 100 times 5,000 words. I can't think of the exact number of words, but you get my point. So, yeah, that's about 500,000 words, right? If my math is right. So, th that's too much of words for anyone to analyze. And that, that takes a heck of a lot of time. So, it's not possible. So, we had to have a limited sample. Usually, qualitative research has a limited sample, which means only a limited number of people. So, you talk to about, let's say, 10 people. So when you talk to only 10 people, there's this always, there's a question, can I generalize my findings to the bigger society? So lack of generalizability is a problem in qualitative research. So this is why we try to get data from multiple areas. Like we interview a person at a time, we interview groups at a time, because when groups, when you interview groups, people sometimes try to argue with each other, which is good. Then you know how these results agree and disagree with each other. And if you go through documents, sometimes you will notice things that people don't say are actually listed in documents. If you talk to a person about discrimination, do you think they will say 100% of the discrimination they have gone through? Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't. So you have to go through existing like newspapers, blog posts, and all of that where people have given more firsthand experiences. So when you analyze all of that, then you can get a rich understanding about a problem. Okay. It's very subjective because people say mostly about their experiences. But it is very useful to explore in-depth information. So quantitative research is more on the surface, but qualitative is more on the depth. You can't generalize it, but you can understand uh, quite a lot about a specific phenomena of interest. It can be valid and reliable, but it always depends upon the researcher. 
Researcher is the main driving force in qualitative research. Analysis is time consuming because you have to go through each interview and then go through that and all of these things. This has roots in sociology and anthropology. So there are different types of qualitative uh, research like qualitative methods, narrative analysis, ethnography, phenomenology. Phenomenology has interpretative phenomenology and grounded theory. So my expertise in qualitative research is pretty much this, phenomenology and interpretative uh, phenomenology. That's why in the beginning, I actually gave a book about interpretative phenomenological analysis as well. Uh, I did interpretative phenomenological analysis for one of my master degrees. And also I did the same for my PhD as well. So yes, so that is an area that I have some expertise, but I haven't done grounded theory or ethnography or narrative analysis so my understanding of the other three is very low i must say so let's try to understand quantitative research quantitative research is numbers based instead of an inductive kind of a thinking here we use a deductive thinking now you might ask what is inductive thinking and what is deductive thinking yes we still haven't discussed that we are going to discuss it next so for the time being, let's just think qualitative use inductive, quantitative uses deductive. Here we use large scale surveys and sometimes we use structured interviews as well, but not very common. Observations are also not very common. And sometimes we analyze already existing documents of uh, numeric information as well. So Anyways, the basic idea is here we have to have numbers. Now, in the upcoming lessons, I will show you how to pull out numbers by giving surveys to people. Right now, that is not our concern because this is the first lecture, so I don't want to overwhelm with you, uh, overwhelm you with unnecessary information. Well, they are necessary information, but uh, not quite necessary right now. Until we figure out the approaches, I think we are okay. So this is not very in depth this is less in depth qualitative research you can ask questions about people's experience and go into depths when you use numbers you can't do that it has to be less in depth but it gives information about quite a lot of people because qualitative research you had limited for a few people since this is survey based most of the times you can use it with multiple people could be thousands even you can analyze thousands and thousands of data with the assistance of statistical software to understand how people generally think and behave and all of that. So the thing here is there's another type called experimental research. Now I'm not going to discuss experimental research here, but experimental research also requires statistics and also it has to be understood separately if i try to go to experimental research right now i think that will create unnecessary confusion so let's just focus quantitative research with surveys for the time being okay and you will of course see other lectures later on uh, experimental methods that i'll be discussing so here we'll be using statistical procedures there are multiple statistical procedures when we learn the software and when we learn different statistical process, you will become even further thorough with all of this. So this can be very reliable and very valid depending upon the researcher and the kind of tools that you use to collect data, okay? And at the same time, the analysis here is less time consuming. So in qualitative research, Analysis takes so much of time because you have to go through word by word. In quantitative research, that problem is not there because analysis is less time consuming. Analysis requires you to feed the data to the software and then with the click of a few buttons, we can get all our results. And here the good thing is the generalizability is really high. So here I have given a table that I got from Google where it compares qualitative research and quantitative research with each other. So please take your time, read through this so that you can have a better understanding. Now, just to sum up, let's discuss inductive and deductive thinking. And I think that we are good for today. So what is inductive reasoning? Inductive reasoning is primarily used in qualitative research. 
where we actually come to a conclusion based on a limited number of observations. So we here proceed from very specifics to general. Now, this is very good you know, when you want to formulate a theory. Now, for example, I do my research on understanding leadership self-efficacy of minority students in Sri Lankan government campuses. So I wanted to understand about their learner experience. So I go and talk to them and when they say about their experiences, I interviewed 14 students. So based on the experiences, I formed some understanding about this is how the learning experience is for these students. And I used a few theories as well. And based on that, I formulate a bigger understanding about how students behave, how minority students behave. And based on that, we developed a bit of a theory. Like this is exactly how this is going to work. Now, the issue is, this is what inductive is all about, limited like, uh, observations, but a conclusion. The thing is, the accuracy of your conclusion will greatly be dependent upon the kind of, you know, uh, premises that you use. Or, because the conclusion is never guaranteed. That's the issue. My conclusion still could be wrong. So it all depends upon how I do it. So that's a good example. I got this from uh, some website as well. So for example, what's the next number in the sequence 6, 13 and 27? There is more than one correct answer, right? So here's the sequence again, 6, 13, 20, 27. Now, what is going to be the next number? Now, the difference is, of course, 7 in each of these numbers. So, for example, one could say this is 34. But then again, if the sequence represents dates in a calendar month, then the next number could be 3, assuming this month has 31 days. It could be 4, assuming this month has 30 days. It could be 5 if we are talking about a leap year and if this month is a leap year, uh, February, then the answer is going to be 5. If it's a normal February, if this month is a normal February, then we are talking about March 6th. So see, this is why I told the conclusion is not always guaranteed. The conclusion tends to vary with the kind of things that we consider. So we have to be very careful. We observe, we recognize some patterns, and then I don't know whether you guys can hear it. There's someone, you know, selling some products outside and the sound kind of, you know, bothers. That's why I took a pause. Okay, that is gone now. So we start by observation and then we recognize some patterns and then based on that we develop a theory. So there's something called hypothesis. I'm not going to discuss that today. We have uh, to discuss it later, but I'll, I'll give one example. I can still remember when we were doing our undergraduate studies, uh, we had a class called experimental psychology. So there we were uh, given a chance to do an experiment with laboratory rats. We were never told, uh, we, we were not told what exactly we are going to do with the rats, but then the first thing that we wanted to do or we were asked to do was to observe rats to see what kind of behaviors they have. So all of us were given a rat inside a, inside a small cage and it had like a choir kind of a bedding. So the rat is there and we were told to observe how the rat behaves, what kind of, you know, postures it makes, what kind of you know, uh, uh, things that it will show, like grooming behaviors and stuff like that. And then we wanted to, you know, write them. And then when we wrote, we understood certain patterns. So I can still remember when I was studying in the university, I used to live in a off-campus accommodation. And then uh, our house, the house that me and my brother used to live, uh, there were some rats actually inside our house so this was the time that i was actually working with rats as well but don't worry i didn't do anything with the rats that i have in my house but i noticed something every time when i get to my kitchen i see some you know rat passes just like this lightning speed they go from one side to the other and i notice they always take the you know edges of the room or the corners of the room to go to a place underneath one of our closets now, immediately I started to see some similarities with what I have seen in the university rats and also the rats I have in my house. And ultimately, I realized that these guys are afraid of light. 
and then when it is dark they go everywhere but when you switch on the light they you know get really panicked and all of that now i did some observations i recognized the pattern and then of course i read i can't say i came up with a theory after that but of course i read a little bit about this and then yes we identified rats are afraid of light so that could be a very simple theory let's say let's that's a you know afraid of light now the next thing that i need to do is now i have already created a specific theory now this is observation pattern recognition theory formation okay induction next one is deduction how am i going to come up with a research so that i can statistically test this now i'll give one good example now i know that my rats are afraid of light not my rats any rat for that matter now let's say i work in a uh, pharmaceutical company we are developing an anxiety drug now i can't test the efficacy or the performance of my anxiety drug directly by giving it to people so we are going to get a bunch of rats now the million dollar question is how are you going to know that rats are going to be anxious or not now i am going to think of my theory i tell them look i know rats are afraid of light one could ask how do you know oh no no someone else has done a research you know i have done a research we have theorized that rats are afraid of light how did you do it inductively so now we know rats are afraid of light and now i have my anxiety drug so i am going to say if rats are really afraid of light then if i give an opportunity for a rat to stay under a bright light probably they are going to get anxious and they are going to run inside to a closed space so there are specific apparatus that are designed for these kind of purposes okay in in later lessons probably we can discuss but for the time being just let's think like this okay let's say there's an apparatus where one side is closed one side is open so i am saying the moment you show this light the rat is going to go to the closed space because the rat is afraid of light and i know that because it's a accepted theory inductively approved or demonstrated can't say approved but if i give my anxiety pill to the rat if my anxiety pill is really effective i am sure rat will spend some time outside under the light as well why because they get anxious that's why they run inside if my drug is working then they are going to stay outside so if this theory and all of this is correct i am going to focus on two things one my pill and the time that the rats are going to you know stay outside so if the rats under the pill is going to spend more time outside compared to the rats who are not given the pill then my theory is statistically demonstrated to be effective just there are some other statistical process that associated with this we'll discuss that later but for the time being at least by face value my drug seems to be working how did i come to this i came to this with deductive reasoning i did the theory formulated one inductively from that theory i considered you know very deductively you can't test the theory as it is you had to pick a few things out of it i focused on the time the rats stays outside and the pill so from this entire theory if this theory is correct then they will spend some time outside compared to you know individuals who don't have the anxiety drug similar to you know arguments that we have made here these are all deductive arguments see all students of msc class can dunk a basketball kelly is a student of msc class therefore kelly can dunk a basketball all rats are afraid of light i have a rat here so this rat should be afraid of light as well not this rat any rat for that matter same deductive argument why because we have already demonstrated it inductively now we are going to test it deductively so deductive research non deductive research deductive reasoning the focus is on a few variables so for students one one of the things that we say is try to keep things very simple very simple you don't need to make it super complicated just focus on a little scenario just like what i just said and then it will become all clear to you how this research actually works 
However, once again, be very careful. The accuracy of your conclusion will depend upon the quality of the information that you have given. If all rats are afraid of light, I have a rat, my rat is also afraid of light. That will be correct only if my first statement is right, which is all that rats are afraid of light. If that is wrong, my conclusion obviously is wrong. Look at this. All math teachers are over seven feet tall. Mr. D is a math teacher. Therefore, Mr. D is over seven feet tall. That is obviously wrong. Why? Because logically it sounds okay, but information is not right. Because you can't possibly say all math teachers are over seven feet tall. So if I say all rats are afraid of life, I better need to make sure that that is right information. If that piece is wrong, the entire argument is going to be erroneous. So this is why when we find information, we go to a research database and we find this information. If I can go to a research database like Directory of Open Access Journals or Frontiers or NCBI, EBSCO host, Psychin, for some way over that matter, and find research papers that justifies, yes, that's are afraid of light, then I can be sure about my study. And I can be sure about my anxiety pill. Now, this is exactly why I spent some time to help you know more about research databases and why finding information from databases is very important. Now, this is how deductive would work. Theory, observation, confirmation. Hypothesis we'll discuss later, not today. Theory, observation, confirmation. They are observation, pattern recognition, theory, induction. You have a theory developed through induction. Now you are testing it in a deductive framework. So inductive tends to be usually very qualitatively driven. Deduction used to, uh, usually we do quantitative. Now this is exactly how it works. Now to further read up on research, to have that enthusiasm, I would encourage all of you to have a research gate account and also maybe create an academia account as well. And to further help with your research work, I would encourage you to use uh, mybib.com to help you, uh, okay. mybib.com to uh, create skewed APA references. This is a very important step. And please use Grammarly to improve quality of writing. Okay. So this is exactly how it works. So I hope. I was able to give you some understanding about how uh, research functions, what is qualitative research, what is quantitative research, what is inductive, what is deductive. So this is the first lesson. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or comment. Uh, so I shall uh, get back to you very soon. So thank you very much for your enthusiasm in listening to my lecture today. I'll see you again with a similar lesson in the upcoming week. So thank you very much. Have a very nice day ahead.